Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited to be here on the last day of Startup Boston Week. Uh, my name is Emily Batt. I am a seed stage investor at Pillar Venture Capital. Uh, I, prior to becoming an investor, I spent the last 10 years in engineering and product uh, at big tech, small tech startups, uh, every flavor. And I've had the uh, incredible honor of working at Kayak, which was started by Paul English, but we did not overlap. And so it's pretty wild to see how the impact of a single person can really uh, permeate the culture of a, of a company many years later. So I'm very excited to be here with Paul today. It's quite an honor. Uh, Paul, your reputation precedes you. You have been born and raised in Boston. You went to UMass Boston for a bachelor's and master's in computer science, if I recall, uh, and then have since started eight companies. Is that right? It depends on how you count. I've sold six. <laughs> sold six. And then I have a new one. I'm running a venture studio right now, but we have nine companies under development. So I don't know how you count, but okay, I've, I've sold six in a row. And now I'm working on something new. <laughs> that's a lot. And uh, three philanthropic ventures? I've started three nonprofits that have scaled, and I'm just in the process of starting a fourth one, which is around mental health. Incredible. Uh, okay. And so your operating history is very deep. How about your investing history? I've invested in 60 companies. Um, I have a profile up on AngelList. My AngelList login is English Paul M. And my IIR, my IRR is, I think, 30.5, return capital 4.4. So I think that's pretty good for yeah, like an nothing, amateur Nothing investor. to shake a stick at. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty good. Uh, okay, that's, that's really incredible. So I think that we can take this conversation in a number of directions. But one thing we really wanted to make sure to cover today is lessons from, from past investments and past ventures. So uh, going back to, to history, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on your role in the venture ecosystem, because you've sort of sat in, in every position at this point as, as founder, as operator, as investor. And if I uh, comb through the history books, if I recall correctly, when you started Kayak, you were actually an EIR at, at Greylock, uh, but Kayak was sort of at least ideated in part with General Catalyst. Um, can you talk a bit about the dynamics of the, the relationship between founders, VCs, and how you've seen that play out in a, maybe a few examples? Yeah, the story with Kayak was um, my friends at Greylock have said they regretted passing on Kayak. Um, Kayak was started by myself and Steve Hafner. Steve was one of the founders of Orbitz. And Steve had hooked up with Joel Cutler, General Catalyst, with the high level concept of building a search engine for travel. Um, I was working at Greylock and had been over to GC one day with my friend Larry Bond looking at a mobile company for them and met Steve by chance. And within an hour, maybe within 45 minutes or less, we decided to be co-founders in the company together. And we really um, began the company inside of General Catalyst. I think we raised 5 million from GC and I put in a million and C put in a million. So 7 million for Series A, which is small considering today's rounds. Um, and then off to the races. But I was at Kayak for a total of 10 years. We started it in 2004, January. I met Steve in December 03. And then we ended up taking it public and um, then ultimately selling it to Priceline. Yeah, uh, I mean, that is an incredible arc. And you've just continued to launch company after company since then. So, uh, not all of them have been successful. As you look at that sort of hockey stick growth that you guys had and then uh, compare it to other ventures that you've started, um, how do you think that having the, the juxtaposition of success and failure has made you a sharper investor? Yeah, I will say, um, I'm sorry if it's gonna come across as bragging a little bit, but any of my startups that I've been full-time at has been successful. <laughs> I've had some side projects which have not been successful and I still, um, and wounded by those failures because even though they were just side projects, they were things I was really passionate about. And I've learned from those failures. Um, so for me, being successful is almost entirely about the team. And as an investor, I invest in the team before I invest in the idea. I'm a proud, in, one of my 60 investments that I like telling a story about is pilot.com. They do bookkeeping services. And I invested in them before I knew what they were doing because I just love the founders so much. I had the privilege of investing in them in a prior startup that they had sold to Dropbox. They sold the first one to Oracle, the second one to Dropbox. And when I heard they were about to leave Dropbox and start on the company, I said, please let me invest. And I didn't want to hear the pitch, I just invested. And they recently financed over a billion dollar valuation. And that was just one where I knew the founders had the mojo 
And they also had a track record of doing before. And I just felt like that was a really, really safe bet. And with my ventures, it's like the more time I put in recruiting, the more that pays off. And it's both recruiting people f- from my past as well as bringing in fresh blood because you always want to have a mix of people that you know and are known to be successful as well as bringing new ideas into the company. Yeah, um, let's double click on that a second because um, in several of your ventures, you've had a core team follow you from place to place. Uh, and in investing, lots of times investors are backing people that they know personally. So can you comment on a time when maybe like the lines have gotten blurry or it's been tough to navigate a relationship because the the nature of the re- relationship has changed as you've either invested in someone or worked with someone? Where has that gone wrong? Yeah, usually, I mean, the, the reason it's good to have some of your team being people you've worked with before is you know they're not an axe murderer. Like, you know... They're basically hopefully a good person. They can execute um, and you have chemistry with them. You get along with them. And so it's unusual to work really well with someone at one company and not work with them well at another company. I have had one incident where there's someone, and I won't, I'm going to obscure the details here, but I had someone who had worked with me for a while, was phenomenal. And then I started a company with this person and he ended up having a big fight with the board over a pretty fundamental issue with the company. We're doing a major pivot and he wasn't in support of the pivot or I don't remember the details, but he ended up um, leaving the company, but there was a big question about, did he quit or was he fired? And the ramifications of that were dramatic in terms of his stock agreement. And that was tricky for me to negotiate as his colleague for 15 years, because I want to protect him, but I also want to protect all my other shareholders and all the employees. Uh, that was the only one that comes to mind about something tricky but between somebody working for a long time. And in that specific case, what I did is I brought the chair in. Uh, she was a very experienced operator and wasn't as close to this person as I was. And so she gave some independence and helped me kind of navigate that. Uh, so as an investor, have you found any shortcuts to quickly evaluate people? You know, how are you such a good read of, of people so quickly, um, especially when you have this pattern of working with someone for, for decades, you know, what can you do to sort of leapfrog that depth of relationship and, and reach, say, an investment decision? Yeah. So at Kayak, um, I'm mostly known for running the design team, but I think more important at Kayak was my recruiting skills. And recruiting skills not everything is something you can learn, but recruiting skills are something you can learn. Um, you have to become a good storyteller. That itself is a important criteria for all aspects of entrepreneurship. You need a good storyteller to raise money, to hire people, to get press, to get customers. Um, and that is something you can learn by watching great storytellers at TED or on YouTube or whatever. Um, so part of recruiting is being able to craft that vision where People can visualize themselves at your company and they can visualize themselves helping form the culture of your company, which is really important for the first years. I also have certain shortcuts about um, evaluating people. I don't know whether I can tell these secrets now because now people can <laughs> yeah, reverse engineer for the how good to interview stuff, with me. <laughs> but um, I won't go into too much detail, but I like hearing them tell stories about their past work, successes and failures. Mm-hmm. And I like hearing them talk about people they work with in the past. Mm-hmm. And often you can get a good uh, sense of someone, not by asking them theoretical questions like, um, you know, how do you know if it's a good product or how do you hire or how do you know how much to invest in a, in a feature? Or, or I don't know, some questions seem generic, but if you ask questions that about a specific team and a specific project and a specific time, it's harder for them to bullshit. And they talk honestly and with memory about what happened at that point in their resume. And I find when you ground someone into a very real experience, you can get a sense of what it's like to work with them. And I do it fast paced and just try to get them to tell me a lot about the company, but particularly the team, because the team skills are more important than anything else. 
does it make a difference whether this is uh, early career talent? Because you have a great reputation for picking early career talent and cultivating them and, and, and helping them grow. So uh, I think when you're evaluating someone either as a potential hire or as a potential investment, you're trying to understand their potential uh, and maybe where they are today and, and what that delta looks like. Um, do you how do you how do you think about evaluating where they are today if maybe they don't have that that depth of experience to draw from so one thing i do when i'm recruiting is once i find someone that i think is amazing i'll ask them what other people they know who they also think is amazing and um sometimes i'll do this in the form of a reference check i'll say you know who's the best reference for you and often if they tell if they speak really positively about this reference, this boss I used to work for, or this colleague, and they're really excited about them, give them as a reference. I'll call that reference not so much to get the reference on the candidate, but I'll call the reference to recruit them as well. And um, this worked out many times for me. I often lecture at MIT, I was at MIT this week, and um, it's been a good source of candidates for me. I met a guy, Vinayak Ranade, at MIT many years ago and recruited him to come join Kayak and really loved him, hit it off with him, got along really well. And I remember asking him at the time, we were on campus and I said, who do you think like the top entrepreneurs from your class, someone that you would bet on? And he said, it's a woman named Lanthe Cronus. And I said, can you give me her email? Can you give me her phone number? And he said, well, let me check with her first. And I went on LinkedIn, I tracked her down, I reached out to her, I didn't even wait for him to get back to me. I had a meeting with her the same day and then hired her as well. And both of them went on to have really great careers um, after Kayak. Vinayak sold his company, um, drafted to InstaWork. He's an executive there now, running product. And Lanthi went on to Dropbox and Stripe, I believe. Um, but it's often that when you meet someone amazing, having them help you network to find, okay, I'm really impressed by you. Who impresses you? Like, who are you impressed by? And just always be looking. Always be looking, be able to tell a story, and then be very disciplined about how you interview and how you make that decision. Does that translate to your investment decisions too? It does. My thesis is 70% team, 20% industry, or 20% the problem they're trying to solve, and 10% what they're building. And what I mean by that, for team, for the 70%, what I want to look at is, are they smart? Do they have a track rate of being successful at something? They're known to be successful at what they're about to do now just to demonstrate they have the fortitude and drive to be successful in general. I hired a guy once and I swear that his name is Ted Patton. And I swear the thing I liked most about him was he had an Olympic medal. And I thought it was like really cool. And I thought to get an Olympic medal, you must be like a very driven person. And it translated well. He was a very good marketer, also a very hard worker. But so 70% is a team. Do they have a track record of success? Are they driven aggressive in good ways? Um, confident, but also vulnerable and um, humble and curious. And that is 70% of my decision when I find a founder like that, particularly if I find a group of founders and they get along really well, they finish sentences, they kind of have the mojo, as I was saying before. 20% of my decision is what problem are they trying to solve? Do I find this problem interesting at all? Do I have any conflicts? Like, do I have another company already working on the same problem? And do I think it's a really big problem? And that's 20% of my decision. 10% of my decision is tell me what you're building. And I'm exaggerating a little bit because I probably care a little bit more than 10%, but I really want to say that the team dynamic and the team drive and confidence and humility is by far the most important thing with all my decisions. And it's worked out really well. Yeah, that, that's pretty remarkable. Um, on the subject of investment decisions, I want to go back to something you just said earlier about side projects and side hustles. Uh, in the course of your career, you've had a few very interesting side hustles that, that may surprise the audience. Uh, for example, you drove for Uber for a bit, and there was also a chapter in your life where you were a full-time caregiver. I'm wondering, do you uh, think of those experiences as an important in informing how you operate or how you invest and especially how you evaluate people? Yeah, Uber was an interesting one. I did that because I was working at Lola. We built uh, business travel and expense management. And we were about to put our customer service reps on a version of our software where the client would rate them on a scale of one to five, how good the service was. And a lot of our service reps had anxiety about that, that they're gonna be rated on a scale based on, you know, if they couldn't fix someone's flight, they thought they'd get a bad rating and it wasn't their fault. 
So I basically said, all right, well, I'll go get rated before our software was ready. So I decided to drive Uber to get rated. I will say my rating is 4.96. I'm very proud of that. Um, and um, I learned things that I didn't expect to learn in Uber. I actually was speaking with my girlfriend last night about picking up Uber again because of some things I'd learned that year that I want to relearn. And basically, what surprised me about driving for Uber is I grew up in Boston. But if you look at my calendar, the people I hang out with, it's a lot of people work in tech or um, Haitians. I do a lot of work in Haiti, so like a Haitian connection. But aside from that, there's a lot of people in Boston I never come in contact with. And when I drove for Uber, I met all kinds of people. I met biotech people. I met teachers. I met athletes. I met lawyers. Um, I met people from all over Boston, and that was really fun for me. And now I'm thinking um, I do a lot of work in Dorchester and Roxbury for some of my nonprofit work, but and I have some good friends who live there, but I want to know more people live in Dorchester and Roxbury. So I thought I'd start driving Uber again, but only drive in Dorchester and Roxbury. And it sounds superficial to meet someone through Uber, but you have someone's full attention for like 15 to 20 minutes. And although like the Uber app today, you, there's a preference for, I don't want to talk to the driver. I always tried to get them to talk to me. And um, I'm introverted by nature, but somehow I was able to connect with most of my um, passengers. And I was able to learn something from every one. I actually have a notebook where I wrote down one sentence from every passenger. And it was really eye-opening for me. So I'm about to start that again in Boston, just as a way to meet more people and learn about what it's like to live in a different part of Boston or to be in a different industry. Yeah, that's incredible. I think that um, you have engaged with Boston in so many different ways across your career. And I'm wondering if you could spend a minute talking about uh, The Embrace, one of your most recent Boston projects, and how that intersects with your professional life. Yeah, The Embrace is a memorial to Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King. It's going to be installed on the Boston Common. Um, it'll be unveiled this January, I think January 13th. And it's a 22-foot memorial. It's based on a photograph of when Martin was just informed that he'd won the Nobel Peace Prize. And there's a famous photo of him and Coretta in an embrace, hugging. And our the artist that we selected over a year-long process is a guy named Hank Willis Thomas, an extraordinary artist. And he took that photo and basically built a memorial, a statue of just the two of them embracing just their arms hugging each other around the shoulders. The reason this project was really important to me is in 2016, um, with the 2016 presidential election, a lot of nationalist rhetoric started happening in the US and racist rhetoric. And um, I just felt like Boston is a city that, there's a lot of great things about Boston, but there's also some racism in Boston. And as someone who grew up here, I want to do more for the city around race relations and opportunity. So I was visiting the MLK Memorial in San Francisco and I said, we need something of this scale in Boston because not everyone knows that Boston is where Martin met Coretta. They were both students here and it's where their, their personal lives and their professional lives began. And I wanted to commemorate that. And then I wanted to think about if they were still alive today, and I think they'd be about 92 years old or so, uh, and if they were still alive and still living in Boston, what would they be working on? And therefore, what should we work on? And so the memorial itself hopefully will be great and will cause people to take pause, the boss coming, who is this, why is this here, why Boston, and have some conversations. Um, the bigger work is ahead of us, which is we're building something called Embrace Boston, which is a um, nonprofit focus on social and racial justice, in particular, we're looking at racial wealth equity. And that's what I wanna spend the next 10 years working on, which is in particular, how to bring, I would like to bring a thousand uh, jobs to Boston in Dorchester and Roxbury that are paying $100,000 a year or more. That's a part of the city that there are not a lot of $100,000 jobs. And 1,000 isn't that big a number, but um, it's a start. And there's a lot of things like that we want to do focus on just racial uh, equity uh, in Boston. So it all started with a memorial, but it's grown to that to a number of other projects. Yeah. Uh, I, how does that overlap with your investment decisions? Obviously, tech can be uh, a great platform for job creation. Do you think about that and uh, and how those can overlap when you're evaluating investments? They can. I'm a big supporter of programs that have taken people 
outside of tech and training them how to join tech. So general assembly, um, hack diversity, resilient coders. I've supported each of those programs and I've seen incredible success story. We have someone, I won't name names, but there's someone at one of my companies who grew up in our city um, and in his own description said his goal in high school was not to you know, become a casualty of one sort of another and um, single parent household, parent working minimum wage. And I think he didn't go to college, didn't have role models for that. And he ended up getting a job as a pharmacy tech, making 40K a year, you know, in the back of a CVS, putting pills in bottles, but he's incredibly sharp and he wanted more than that for him. And he went to a um, startup um, training bootcamp and got a job as a programmer. And then I hired him a year later. And then I, when I hired him a year later, I think I hired him at 80K. And I'm happy to say right now, I'm trying to think if I get the exact number right, but I think he's making about 250K salary plus a significant bonus. And this is someone who um, didn't really have a path until he came across a boot camp that really got him into tech and accelerated his learnings in that field. So I've seen it happen with him and with, with many other people. And I just want to do it on a larger scale across Boston. Yeah, it's it's hard, <laughs> but also exciting to think how investing can be a way to create opportunities at scale. Um, do you end up focusing on any like upskilling sectors in your investment or are you not uh, thesis or sector driven so much as founder driven? In general, I'm founder driven. If I had to pick a sector, it'd be mass market consumer software, websites and apps, simply because that's most of my career. I also think consumer is the most fun because it allows you to talk to anyone about the app you're building. Like when I was building Kayak, um, I literally would buy a ticket to New York, Boston and New York, and not actually fly. I would just do it so I could get through security. And then I would sit at the gate and talk to people, which is, I had to train myself to do this because again, I'm kind of introverted by nature, but I would find a way to strike a conversation with someone and say, what's, what site did you use to book this flight? And they would say, I'd use Expedia or whatever. I would say, oh, I'm actually part of a startup that we have a search engine called Kayak. Can I show it to you? And I would show them uh, the app and they would immediately click with it, like they'd get it. And you can't do that with B2B software. You can't walk up to any random stranger and show them your CRM. You could try, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So I like consumer software that you can talk to anyone about what you're working on and they can understand it. So yeah. that's what I get most excited about. Okay. So so help me understand that in your context of incubation, because you've uh, previously started an incubator called Blade. Now you're running Boston, Boston Venture Studio. How do you think about um, incubation in general and whether it needs to be uh, aligned with your interests? Be um, and I ask because if I recall correctly, out of Blade, you ended up starting your own company. Yeah. Um, one of my board members, Yang Min Moon, she's a professor at HBS, one of the most popular professors at HBS, was on my board at Blade. And she had seen the companies we invested in. And she said, these are interesting founders, interesting companies. She goes, but what would really excite me is to see you build something again. She goes, I think you're a builder. Uh, at your nature. So I'd, I'd like to see you build something. And for some reason that struck a chord. I'd only been at the incubator for a year and then I got itching to build something again. So we started working with the team and we built two companies that were our own and one of them became Lola, which we sold last year to Capital One um, after a very difficult year because we were a travel company during COVID. Uh, but we were able to pivot that and sell that successfully to Capital One. But it was Young Me Moon that got me to transition from just being coach advisor to building something again. And then you mentioned Boston Venture Studio, my current uh, initiative. The difference between an incubator and a studio, an incubator or an accelerator helps other people with their ideas. A venture studio is a little bit more arrogant than that, so I apologize for it. We only work on our own ideas. And right now we have nine apps under development. And some of them are just free utilities we built for fun. Like we have a website, middle.net, that we built that if you're trying to meet a friend across the other side of Boston, you want to know where to meet, you just go to middle.net or pick a coffee shop or bar. It's actually very helpful. Yeah. Um, so we have some simple utilities like that, but then we have some things that are real companies that were swinging for the fences and um, I'm having an absolute blast. Are you working on all nine of them? Yes. How do you manage that and investing and your philanthropic work and traveling? <laughs> yeah, I travel about 100,000 miles a year. Travel is really important to me. Um, even though 
I'm running four nonprofits and now bringing to life nine companies and frequently teaching. I have very little stress in my life. I should also say I do hundreds of emails a day. And I think the reason I have very little stress in my life, one is I've been studying Buddhism with Madeline Klein at Cambridge Insight Meditation Center. And she has taught me a lot about alleviating stress. Um, I forget the serenity prayer. It's like, who knows the serenity prayer here? Let God tell me the difference. Let me know the difference between, oh, I'm bumbling this. It's knowing the difference between things you can change, things you can't change. And the things you can't change, just accepting them completely. And the thing you can change, change them. You know, if it's something that needs change. I forget the prayer, but it's something around that. And there's a similar Buddhist tech, uh, learning about that as well. And so learning that has caused me just to not have stress about things I can't change. And then as far as day to day, I color code my calendar. I have four colors. I use Google Calendar. And those colors represent the four corners of my life. I have a great assistant, Kate. And I look at my calendar with her every Monday, Friday for two weeks in advance. And I make sure there's balance across those colors. If they're balanced across those colors, I feel like I'm doing the right thing. So yellow is nonprofit. I try to do about eight hours a week of meetings. Um, green is self-improvement. And that could be everything from going to Buddhism class to uh, going to the gym, going to a medical appointment, anything around improvement. And I try to do that every day. And then uh, the last two colors are for work which is I try to do from 10 a.m. to noon and 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. So seven hours a day of uh, like Boston Venture Studio. And then everything else is friends and family. And by managing my calendar that way, I find that I don't ever get burnt out because I don't need to take a break from work because I take a break from work every day. Uh, that uh, goals, <laughs> goals. Uh, let's spend a minute talking about um, the environment today, which is uh, looking um, uncertain. Uh, and you know, before this session, I spoke to some investors about what they're seeing in early stage investing today, and uh, the sentiment that were that I heard from from the friends that I asked is like, oh, you know, last summer we were seeing seeds at. 20 or 25 post money cap. Now it's more like mid teens, low teens. Uh, and so it feels like we're in this moment uh, where things are, 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 are changing quickly. And I'm wondering if you can comment whether the environment feels like a chapter that you've seen before in Boston or in tech generally, and uh, how you think about navigating uncertain times. It is, but um, I think Paul Graham wrote about this recently, maybe the listing, all the companies were created in the 2008 recession. I think when there is a recession or um, some sort of change that's, that's cutting back VC dollars, there's still a credible opportunity to build something new when the economy is shifting. When the economy is shifting, it's creating problems for people. And the, what entrepreneurs do is they solve problems. And so what you need to do in an economy like this is realize what are the problems people are having and what can you do to help those problems? And if you can find a way to solve a problem that a lot of people in society are having, you'll create a very successful company. Um, recruiting might be harder in some ways right now, but um, again, that should be job one for any entrepreneur is spending the extra hours to find that co-founder and find those original 10 people. But I think that there's always opportunity to create great companies. It might be a little bit harder to find capital than it was just two years ago. But I think if you find great co-founders and you get started and you start building something, you'll find the capital. And for folks who are thinking about moving into investing or maybe starting a fund, uh, in a time like this, how do you think about the trade-off between starting a fund, starting an accelerator, starting an incubator? Where do you think um, where do you think people should start? I um, lectured at MIT a few days ago and the professor Bill Allett asked me to give career advice to three students, which he picked randomly. And so he had them come up one at a time. And it's quite challenging to give career advice to someone you don't, that you just met. So I interviewed each one of them for five minutes and then gave them advice. And the first guy said that I asked them each where they were before MIT, what they want to do 10 years from now, what they want to do a year from now. And he had talked about he wanted to work in venture capital. And my answer to that may be a little bit flippant, but I basically said, um, a VC, hopefully, if you have good intent, which I do believe most VCs have good intent, even though 
a lot of people like to poke at VCs. I think most of them do have good intent. And if you have good intent as a VC, your job is to help people create companies, where if you're a founder, your job is to create a company. And so you need to decide, do you want to be the coach or the athlete? Like, do you want to be Bill Belichick or you want to be Tom Brady? And um, I have decided, even though I'm, I do invest and I do like mentoring and I like opportunities like this, sort of reflecting on what I've learned in my career, what really gets me excited is building something. So for people going to investing, some will make a career of it. Others will do it simply to get some pattern recognition about what things get funded and meet a bunch of people. But in either case, if you are interested in sort of putting a toe in the water in investing, you could join an angel group, which is very easy to do. Um, and that way you'll get some deal flow. You'll meet some other investors. Or if you um, are lucky, you'll get an EIR at a venture capital firm or join as an associate or junior associate. And that's a way to see deal flow and meet other entrepreneurs. And that's kind of the way to get started. Yeah, that's great. Um, let me pause here and see if we have any questions coming in from online or from the audience. <laughs> One second. Let me just bring the mic to you. <laughs> so that our audience virtually can hear you. Okay. So um, I just want to say thank you to Startup start Boston Week for putting all this together. It's hard to find this kind of stuff. And uh, Paul, I randomly came into this room. I didn't know what it was going to be about. And I couldn't be happier that you're the person up there. I wanted to ask you something about, um, you know, if you think back to the beginning of like Kayak or at some point in the earlier days, uh, there's a recognition that you make that, you know, with writing code and functions and having conditions kick in as people navigate your software, you can essentially create a machine that runs 24-7, 365 that can just blow away uh, anything that even a whole bunch of human beings could do if they had to do it on their own. Um, and you reach a point in that software where you look at it and you're like, like, whoa, you know, it's, it's like doing everything I dreamed it could do and uh, it doesn't complain or get tired. And you have your team, say 10, 12 people that built that and they're priceless people, literally. And, um, and you have probably stories about every one of them. What I wanted to get from you, which is hard to find, um, take someone that is a, you know, product person. Um, what goes off in your head in terms of the light bulbs that allows you to recognize when you go from, say, your 12 person team with the machine that you feel like you could really flex and, and push to take on? I don't know who Kayak was competing with at the time, but, you know, somebody may have said, what are you, what are you talking about? How are you going to compete with Travelocity or Expedia, whatever it was? How do you make that transition to hire the next, say, 10 people and to kick yourself into um, full on growth mode and sort of stay away from the, um, like at some point you're afraid to kick the thing because you're not ready advancing the software far enough. How do you like transition into that phase and uh, what does that look like? Because yeah, you know, it's me, hard. I think the question you're asking gets the very nature of what is an entrepreneur, what kind of makes them tick. And the first thing I would say about entrepreneurs is they are great observers. And they, one of the best compliments I think you'd give an older person is to say they're childlike. And by childlike, I mean, if you watch um, a mom or dad with their two-year-old kind of walking down the street or across a park, it looks maddening for the parent because the kid stops every two feet and wants to look at something. And the best entrepreneurs are like that as well. They're always looking and observing and seeing what works and what doesn't work. And they always want to improve things. And so at Kayak, when we had a dozen engineers and um, code that was running 24-7, 365 and doing well and booking millions of flights, we were observing with our customers by talking to them on the phone. And I, if you couldn't meet them in person, you should talk to them live on the phone. I was famous at Kayak for, I, I bought an old, red phone with a mechanical ringer and put it on my desk and publish the phone number directly on Kayak's help pages. So we'd randomly get phone calls during the day. And you learn from them what's working, what's not working. And if you are a perfectionist or a craftsman and you're an observer, you'll always find something that's not working. You'll always find something that you can make better. And for us, we were going against Expedia. When we started Kayak, Expedia had 2000 engineers and they were spending a billion a year just in brand, not including all of advertising. And people said, how can Kai compete against a company like this? And I said, and this was um, maybe a little overconfident, but I said, if you take my 10 smartest people 
and you take Expedia's 10 smartest people, I'd easily put them in a room together because I'm a really good recruiter. And I bet my 10 best engineers are better than Expedia's 10 best engineers. And invention starts from the people actually doing the work because they're the ones who come up with the ideas and try it. And you build something that you think is twice as hard as you can possibly do. And then you get that done. Then you build something that's twice as hard again. And you keep raising the bar as you see success along the way. I will say my proudest stat about Kayak was we were taking it public. And I remember these stats because we did 100 investor meetings at the roadshow. We had 200 employees and 300 million in revenue. So it was a million and a half revenue per employee, which is not only higher than anyone had ever done in the travel industry. It was higher than Google and Facebook. And the reason I think we were so profitable was we put every energy into scale and speed, everything from how we hired to how we ran meetings. Everything was focused on efficiency and scale. And I think it made Kayak a really vibrant place to work that it's very fun to work in a place that, are, that operated at that speed where you didn't have committees, you didn't have management review teams, you let people just try stuff. And that kind of what defined Kayak. And if, when we have a culture like that and you're good at recruiters, I think you can change the world with a small number of people. So thank you. Any other questions? We have one over here. How you doing, Paul? Thank you for speaking with us today. Uh, my name is Stanley, uh, founder of um, Renovest. And so my question is, as um, entrepreneurs, there's aspects in which we want to focus on duality, you know, and the hustle and the bustle of, you know, creating your startup. But, you know, the other parts of, you know, <laughs> you know, spending time with family and, you know, making sure that, you know, we're not overstressing ourselves. I think you've done a really great job in regards to balance, you know, um, you know, focusing on a mental. And so how long did it take you to be able to, you know, find that balance to be able to, you know, continue your particular interests, um, whether it's in nonprofits, but then also, um, you know, be the individual you are who's um, as far as, you know, building Kayak and all the other companies after that followed after. I would say I did not have balance in my 20s. Um, another thing about me is I have bipolar illness and it was bad in my 20s. And in my 20s, I worked a million hours a week as an engineer, but really got burnt out and burnt relationships at the time because I put all my energy into work. Um, it wasn't until my 30s and even 40s that I really started to master how to be bipolar and how to be high function in relationships and in work. I think um, for me, and um, the Buddhist studies, and it's not so much Buddhism itself that is the thing that led me on the path I'm on right now, but some of the concepts that I learned in Buddhism helped gave me balance and helped remove stress and helped me appreciate moments. So in Buddhist school, you learn, you study mindfulness and meditation, and they're two separate things. They're related, but they're separate. And mindfulness is everything from when you're brushing your teeth to focus completely on brushing your teeth, like really think about the feeling with your gums and everything. And if you do that only for two minutes, but then do other things very mindfully too, the way you wash dishes, the way you walk, the way you put out the trash, after a while, you train yourself to be able to be present in the moment and where you don't have fears about the past. You don't have fears about the future. You're allowed to execute things with a focus in the moment, whatever those things are that you're choosing to execute. So those things help me a lot. Thanks for the question. Any others? Coming over to you. Hey, Paul, how are you doing today? Yeah, it was funny you mentioned uh, mindfulness and meditation in general. I actually practice uh, Vipassana meditation myself. And to your point, like, let's say depression, that's somebody identifying with thoughts of the past or anxiety, somebody identifying with things that may occur in the future. I'm just curious, like from your perspective, why mindfulness uh, meditation isn't more prevalent in, let's say, school or early learnings in life? Because I feel like it's just as important as like working out your body or anything else. So I'm curious as to what your take is on that. Yeah, that's a good question. If anyone here in the room or online is an educator who wants to do meditation with their students, uh, come find me because I'd be happy to help a program like that. I know it's been done in some schools. To me, I think one of the reasons meditation isn't more widely done 
is it's really hard at first. Like when a lot of people try to meditate, they'll read a book or listen to class and they try to meditate and they'll sit in a chair, like you don't want a chair to be too comfortable. You don't want to fall asleep. You'll set your timer. I set my iPhone. Sometimes for as little as 10 minutes, you close your eyes and you focus on your breath, let's say, as your device. And then nine minutes in, you realize, shit, I've been thinking about work for the last nine minutes. This meditation thing is so hard. Um, I can't focus my breath. My mind is too fast. I get distracted too often. This is hard. I hate this. I give up and I quit. Um, what you need to learn, I came up with this. So Malcolm Gladwell in one of his books talks about to be an expert at something, you need to practice for 10,000 hours, whether that's violin or throwing uh, free throws in basketball. He later admitted he kind of made up that number. There wasn't any science behind it. But anyway, it was, I remember reading that and thinking that's really interesting. I, I think a lot about that, actually, that number. When I think about new pursuits I want to uh, work on now. But I made up a corollary for meditation. In order to be good at meditation, you need to get distracted 10,000 times. But it's not really distracted 10,000 times. You need to realize you're distracted 10,000 times and bring it back. And centering... The, at the body again, when you get distracted, whether it's for a minute or 10 minutes or an hour, and you're off somewhere, and then you say, I wish to think about work. Instead of cursing yourself, you should say, celebrate the awareness that just happened. You just became aware. And then when you bring that back to your breath, and you do that 10 times, and 100 times, and 1,000 times, and 10,000 times, the more muscle memory you have for taking distraction to calmness, means the next time you're in rush hour traffic and someone cuts you off, it won't phase you at all. Like it, your heart won't accelerate because you're so, you have such muscle memory for focus and calmness. And so for me, meditation has helped a lot. There's a, there's a Buddhist saying, respond, don't react. And um, that just has always been very meaningful to me. And it's helped me a lot. And I'm not here to preach. I mean, Buddhism is not a religion, really because it's not really about gods or God. But um, I will say mindfulness practice, even more than meditation, but mindfulness and meditation has been transformative for me. I used to be someone that got angry a lot, and Thich Nhat Hanh was a, a Vietnamese teacher. Through his uh, lessons, I've learned not to get angry anymore. If I do get angry, it dissipates immediately. Um, if someone wrongs me, I forgive them immediately. Um, these are things that I've learned in mindfulness. So. I'm glad it works for you too. Other questions in the room? I'll ask a quick one then. Um, on that point, when it's something that it's not in your control, um, if it's relationships with people throughout a venture, throughout anything you're investing in with boards of directors or co-founders, how do you navigate points of friction when it's two people to the party or multiple people to the party how do you address that? How have you addressed that? Usually when two intelligent people disagree, it just means they're acting on a different set of information. And if someone says something and does something that you find offensive or stupid or you just disagree with, sometimes just by questioning them and understanding more about, it could be about their day, their background, but more about what made them form that opinion you'll often change your own mind. Um, and sometimes by sharing information like why you're driven to make a certain decision, if you under, if you explain your rationale, sometimes you'll change their mind. So to me, it's about shining light on a problem and trying to see all the inputs. And if two reasonable people see all the inputs and they have the same goals, very frequently they'll go to the same conclusion. One of the nice things about working in tech is if you're disagreeing with on a product issue, it's very easy. You just build both of them and you see which one wins and you, you just be very data-driven. But in life, it doesn't always work out like that. Um, but I think that just listening, like having compassion for the other person and trying to understand them completely allows you to interact with them, for me, without stress. The other thing is if there are people in your life who make you feel bad, um, you shouldn't have people like that in your life. They can say offensive things, but it's up to you to, how to respond to that. And you can say something really offensive to me, but I decide if I give you the power to let that impact me. And I might not give that power to you if you're, if you're someone who is just around to take people down. I might not give you that power. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
So I had a question about, uh, well, I liked your description of the venture studio versus the incubator. And uh, frankly, that sounds like the dream, uh, <laughs> as, you know, to be able to uh, launch a number of your own ideas. I was just curious, um, do you bring in, uh, how do you pick people for that? Are they running sort of their own business under your umbrella? Or how does that even work, having sort of multiple threads going on at the same time? Yeah, so I'm always recruiting. I hope I hire some before I leave this room. Um, I just, I get a lot of incoming. So last night I lectured at Brown. On Monday, I was at MIT. And as a result of those um, guest lectures, I'm getting a lot of incoming now from Brown and MIT. And it allows me to meet a lot of people. And when I meet someone who I think has that spark and also has, um, like, the good people, work is hard. And so you want to work with people that are fun. I think, although I would say I'm a quick judge of people, I also like spending a lot of time with people I'm interviewing because if you spend, let's say, a dinner with someone you're about to hire in a really important uh, role, can you spend three hours with someone without getting bored and distracted, without getting irritated? Um, are you still enjoying their stories? you still want to hear their stories? And meeting people, I think, is easy. It's trying to figure out, can you and this person together make something magical or do something different? Is there some, do they bring something to the table that you don't have that you want to learn about? And one of the things I learned in Uber driving is I think just about every passenger I had knew something that I didn't know. And um, I wanted to learn more from almost all my passengers. I'm not going to say all my passengers, but almost all my passengers. So when you're looking to hire people and bring people into your studio, wherever it is, you want to bring someone in who has different ideas and also be just really fun working with. Thank you. We have a couple of questions online, and then Emily, I'll throw it back to you. Um, so there's a founder of an ed tech called Wempo based in Peru. They're profitable and growing fast, ready to scale up. They're asking for recommendations uh, for their first round of investors. What kind of indicators do you look for, and where do you go find the resources you need to attract them? Um, I was in Peru in May and had an amazing time, did Machu Picchu, which is amazing, and I love Lima, amazing food and wine, so thank you for your country. Um, I would say, I don't know what the investment scene is in Peru, per se, I don't even know if there's much of a VC community there, but um, I would reach out to other ed tech companies and see who funded them, like look who's on their board and start reaching out to them as a starting point. Because if they've already backed another ed tech company that's not directly competitive, but is in the sector, they either will take a meeting with you to hear about your idea, or they will introduce you to someone that they think might be a better fit for you. So I would do that. And don't ever take no for an answer. Be, when you're trying to make contact with someone, just be very, very aggressive. Do whatever it takes to get that contact. I like LinkedIn a lot. I like finding someone I know who knows that person. And sometimes I'll even go one more level of direction beyond that. Um, find a way to get to those people who invest in other ed tech and find an opportunity to pitch them. Thank you. And one last one. What qualities make for insightful, trustworthy investors? How can an entrepreneur determine... Um, if a potential investor is compatible, more than just provocative or well-resourced? Picking your investors is really important because many times, like at Kayak, I spent 10 years with some of my investors, which is a long time to spend with someone, longer than a lot of relationships. Um, you want to spend time with your investors up front to really evaluate is this someone you're going to have fun working with in good times and in bad times? If this person is going to be on your board, you want to reference check them. You want to talk to other entrepreneurs that have worked with the investor. And you want to ask those entrepreneurs, what were they like in good times? What were they like in bad times? What's the best thing you learned from that investor? Like, did they actually help you more than the check? Um, how do they help you? And when did you disagree with the investor? What do those disagreements look like? So I know it seems like a lot of work, but um, your investor could be with you for a long time, particularly if they're on your board. Uh, do the homework. Emily, back to you. That's great. Well, I, I wanted to ask one more question about how you evaluate people and decisions, um, because you spoke a couple times today about how you're introverted. And on the other end of the Myers-Briggs letters, one thing I'm really fascinated by is the difference between P and J, perceiving and judging. And uh, something that I heard in, in your earlier comment is 
entrepreneurs are curious, they're childlike, they're observing, they're perceiving, but investors are often making quick decisions, they're, they're judging. So where do you think you fall between P&J and how do you balance those two ends? It's been many years since I took Myers-Briggs. I think it was INTJ, so I think it was on the judgment side. But um, if I remember correctly, I was in the middle of I and E, introvert, extrovert, and I think I was in the middle of P and J. And if I were to take the test again today, I don't know where I would land on that. But I try to be someone who, um, what I've learned over the years is trying to really understand the other person, like listen carefully. I've taken classes. I took an, Last year, I took an eight-week class on compassion on developing compassion. And I hope my friends would say I'm a compassionate person, but I wanted to figure out how to get more compassionate, what's kind of the academic uh, knowledge of that. So I think getting to know people and listen to them helps you make good decisions that involve people. Yeah, what was your biggest takeaway from that class? It's something that's said often, which is while someone's talking, don't think of your answer it's okay to pause at the end of the question, like really try to lean in and understand everything about it. And often when they ask their questions, sometimes I answer with a question because I'm really trying to understand them. And then when they're done asking the question and you think you understand it, if you don't understand it, ask again. If you do understand it, it's okay to pause for a second before you answer. Ah, that's beautiful. Uh, okay, one one last question to wrap it up here. I'm wondering if you could share uh, either an investment or a project or a sector that you're really excited about that you think is at the cutting edge that we can all uh, look into after the session. Yeah, I don't know how to say something different than probably what other people have been saying all week, but I'm blown away with AI right now. I'm blown away with, is it Dolly, the, the image system? It just completely blows my mind that you can type into a search box, um, you know, blue giraffe on Mars with an orange sunset and a surfboard, and out comes this beautiful painting. It just, it's unbelievable. A few years ago, Google Translate, I forget the numbers, but at one point Google Translate, they said when checked with humans afterwards, had about a 92% accuracy, and then suddenly one day went to 96% accuracy. And they asked the guy who ran AI for Google, how did you make that significant jump in a day? And he said, I really have no idea. Um, <laughs> when the machines start programming and the machines start evaluating, they will discover algorithms that we don't understand. And that's really exciting to me. My Tesla last night informed me, it downloads new software all the time. So every time you get in the car, it has new features. And last night it informed me that my car is now running on Tesla Vision. So it's now fully camera-based in, in its navigation. And um, that's both scary, but also kind of exciting. Yeah, super exciting. Could not agree more. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for taking the time to talk with us today. It was an awesome session. And thank you all for your smart questions and, and for being here today.